Anyway, I would like to start by thanking you very much, the University of Keio, for honouring me with this invitation to come to your great university. My wife and I have been here several times. Um, I've even lectured. I think I'm one of the very few foreign outside scholars who've lectured uh, in your speaking hall set up by Fukuzawa, which was a great honour. So it's lovely to be back in Keio. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you all for coming, and partic particularly my long-time friend, uh, Princess Takamado, and my long-time friend, Professor Hayami, uh, sitting here. This is an opportunity, I think, to take stock. You are celebrating your 150th anniversary here at Keio, and we in Cambridge this year are celebrating I don't want to sound superior, but <laughs> our 800th anniversary. Um, and these two great institutions are thinking and reflecting about what is happening in the world and in the world of universities. Today I will talk about the world more generally, and tomorrow I will concentrate more on the universities. I realize I, I haven't checked with you how your um, language uh, abilities are. I should talk perhaps slowly. Um, can most of you understand me if I speak at this sort of speed? Yes? I think you're have, you have doing do great part. Uh, all right, you can understand. If you make no sign, I don't know whether you're just yeah. modest or not understanding anything. Okay, well, I will try and speak fairly slowly then, um, because I would like you to understand what I'm saying, because I think, I hope it is important and serious. Um, the theme of, of today is a comparison of two civilizations, Japan and England, and I have said, they, I gather that they have circulated my paper to you already, so I'm not going to just read that out. Red uh, talks are not very interesting. It's more interesting if I just talk informally to you. And also, spoken language like that is easier to understand than written texts read rather quickly. So I will just talk to my paper. But if you want the, the actual full paper, I'm sure the university can give you a copy if you don't have it. It's um, also a very good time and place to be considering the, this theme. Uh, it's a good place because my great hero in Japan is Fukuzawa Yukichi. I wrote half a book about Fukuzawa and he has influenced my thinking very considerably. As you will all know, he was the founder of your university. And he struck me as one of the very few great figures who, outside Europe, was of the same stature as Montesquieu, as we heard before, or Max Weber. He was a world figure intellectually. I haven't discovered anyone like him in China or in India, though I've been looking. He really understood world civilizations, and he thought very widely and deeply. And as you know, his great theme and problem was that at the Meiji Restoration, Japan was facing a huge pressure from the outside world, particularly from Europe and America, to change very rapidly. And his central problem was how could Japan be changed to meet the pressure and threats of the outside world, and at the same time maintain its independence and its great traditions. So he devoted his whole life to trying to mediate between these two worlds. His greatest book, Theory of Civilizations, was about this. He was, above all, the person who helped Japan make this great transition at the Meiji. And this was one of the great turning points in Japan. I think now, talking to my Japanese friends, 
who've just come down from Hokkaido, talking there and talking to the students. I think you are now in a similar position to the Meiji transition. I'll explain what I mean as the background to what I'm going to say. Japan is like, is, is a great rocky island over which huge historical tsunami, it's interesting we take the word now from a Japanese word for a great wave, great tsunami have swept across Japan um, six times in history. The Chinese 8th, 9th century tsunami, the Chinese 13th, 14th century Buddhist New Land religion tsunami, the Portuguese, Dutch, 16th, 17th century one, the 18th Chinese Neo-Confucian one, then the great Meiji period of Tokugawa, and then the post-Second World War American-European. Each time what's happened is this wave, this huge tsunami has gone over Japan and then receded, gone back. And Japan, like a rocky pool, has profited from all the new ideas and inventions which have sunk down into Japan, but it has not changed at its deep core and root. This time, what is happening is not quite so visible, but I think it is different in nature, and that is that the tsunami is not a tsunami, really. It's a great wave, slower, but it's continuous, and it will not go away. This is the wave of globalization, and the wave of also in other things like the rise of Chinese civilization again. And so Japan is like this rocky pool, which before has been able to recover its identity when the wave has receded a bit. This time, the water is going to be covering Japan for the rest of history. This means that it's very important for the Japanese, as it is for my own country, which is also being covered by this global wave, to adapt to something which will not change or go away, and which will continue to alter Japan at the fundamental level as well as at a superficial level. In order for Japan to survive and maintain all the good things about your country, it's essential that you understand yourselves deeply and you also understand the outside world deeply. You have done this many times. You have understood what is coming in, taken the good bits from it, rejected the bad. But you need to do this really very carefully now Otherwise, you will just be swamped, and your culture will be destroyed, and you will lose everything that is precious about your lives. So you must understand um, your deep history and your, the cultural forces which are playing on you. So my talk is about that. And what I want to do is to explain that as an outsider coming to Japan, as an anthropologist, um, I have become more and more aware of both the things which I share from coming from England with you and the things that separate us. And I want to talk about those similarities and those differences. When I, when I came with my wife in 1990 as, uh, as a British Council visiting scholar to Hokkaido, I was delighted to come to your country, but rather disappointed when I arrived in Narita Airport. Because when I went there and when I went to Sapporo, I felt, why have I come all this way from London to find London? It all looks, as you walk around now through Tokyo, it all looks just the same as what I had left. It seemed very similar in many, many ways. And I was half pleased because there was a theory that Japan and England were very, very similar. A famous economic historian, Eric Jones, had once made a joke and said that Japan felt like an island which had been once off the coast of England 
and then some large boat had pulled it and left it off the coast of China. So like the Isle of Wight or something like this. So people had noticed deep similarities and that was one of the things that interested me. On the other hand, if it was so similar, it wouldn't be very challenging to the mind. But as I spent more time here, and this is my seventh visit with my wife, I began to see that behind the similarities, often just a kind of inversion or upside downness, but behind that there lay deeper differences of an extraordinary kind. This is why I called my book Japan Through the Looking Glass. It was based on the idea of uh, Alice Through the Looking Glass, which uh, is an English children's story in which Alice goes through a glass, a mirror, into another room. And at first, everything looks just the same, except back to front. But then she goes on in her travels, and she finds all sorts of strange creatures and uh, impossible things to understand. And that was my experience with my wife in Japan. It became stranger and stranger. And what I want to do is just to take a few topics and try to explain to you that if you imagine that what we do when we um, try to understand things is we go on a walk. And so I walked into Japan and at first the path I was going along, the Tao, the road path, was very familiar. But then as I went further along this path, I found that it began to, as we say, diverge, to fall. Japan went this way, my culture then went that way. So I want to take you through some of the ways in which that happened. Let me start with politics. The history of Japanese politics and political system, to a large extent, seems just like that in my country. When the great historian Mark Bloch, a medievalist, uh, wrote his book on feudalism, he said that the only country he knew of that had feudalism of the true kind outside Europe was Japan. Um, it was a kind of strange feudalism, and that particularly British feudalism. British feudalism is very odd because it is based on relations, contractual relations between people, but it is also very centralized. The king is very powerful in the system and is the head of the system. All land in England was held of the king and the crown. This is what you might call centralized feudalism, which is a contradiction in terms in some ways, but it is the kind of feudalism we have in England. And therefore I was amazed when I came to Japan to find that many of the great scholars on Japan, like John Paul, used the very first term, centralized feudalism, to describe this strange system in Japan where you have a lot of power going down through the chain of command from the chosen of the emperor down through uh, various levels down to the bottom. And yet everyone looks up upwards to the top as well. So these two political systems have historically been very similar in one way, in that way. And indeed Japan provides an excellent test for a theory as to why this should be the case. Japan and England are islands and there was a theory in the 18th century, put forward by a Scottish philosopher, John Miller, that the reason why England had a balanced political system was because it was an island. Being a big island with sea protecting you means that your whole political system can evolve in a different way from mainland uh, continental countries. And this explained the divergence of England from France 
and continental countries in Europe, because we didn't have to have an army to defend ourselves. We had a navy, and the navy cannot be used by the king to put down uh, powerful forces against him. Uh, sailors have to stay on their boats, and they're no good on land. So we never had a standing army in England, just as you didn't have a standing army of any real kind in Japan. Also, you don't need so many taxis. Armies are very expensive, so our taxing was much less in England and in Japan. Also, um, you can't threaten the people lower down by saying, if you don't do what I tell you to pay your taxes and obey me, I will let the Mongols or the Germans or the Italians get hold of you. I'll just throw you to the foreigners. So basically, you get a balanced political system. And that is the root of centralized feudalism in England. And it turns out that it is the same in Japan and for the same reason. So politically, they look very similar. But when you go further down the path, you get, come to great differences. The English, as you know, developed a world where the middling and the upper property holders, those who held property, um, formed into a powerful group who could stand up against the king. And they formed a parliamentary system. And then that led into parliamentary democracy. In Japan, this never happened at all. There was no parliamentary democracy, obviously, in Japan. There were the seeds of it sown in the Meiji period. And it's proved itself to the world for the first time, really, a few months ago, where you actually got rid of the LDP for a short time, hopefully for a longer time. And so you're beginning to get what we think you should be doing, which is alternating your political parties back and forth. So you have a new parliamentary democratic system here, but we have had a very old one. And that is a big difference. And then another great difference is that we as you went up the power structure in England, at the top, the king was the head of the church and also the head of the political system. We unified the ritual and the political. Uh, that could lead to a very dangerous situation, but that was balanced by our parliamentary system. In Japan, as you know for most of your history, you have separated the ceremonial role, the ritual role of the emperor from the military role and the political role of the shogun. They were brought together um, for a while after the Meiji Restoration and there have been periods in history when this, the two had come together. But for most of the time, for a lot of the time, we separated them and that was different from England. Turning to the next um, topic, which is law. At first, again, the paths seem identical. I was amazed when I came to uh, start studying Japan, reading in the Hokkaido Library, to come across the work of the great American comparative legal theorist, John Henry Wigmore. Some of you may know that Keogh University had produced a number of Wigmore's uh, great works on uh, Tokugawa law uh, and uh, in, in a number of volumes. And Wigmore was a, a great figure in America and he thought about all the legal systems of the world. And he divided, he said there were 16 major legal systems that has, have occurred in world history. 14 of them were of one kind. Two of them were of another kind. And the two that were of another kind were England and Japan. England and Japan had judge made a legal system, particularly in the Kamakura period, but at other times, of a legal system that is not based on uh, a constitution and a set of formal rules, but is based on precedents decisions that are made earlier, 
that have been made by judges on spoken, a spoken tradition of that kind. And this is the system that we developed in England and was taken to America, Anglo-American law. And Japanese law was like this for most of its period. And laws emerged in our two island countries, but then they were codified and enforced. In Roman law systems on the continent or in Chinese systems, there is much more regulation and much more written down, and there were rules written down. But after this great similarity in the legal system, you begin to get the paths diverging. Um, in England, we go to law all the time. We love the law. It's an outdoor sport like cricket or football for us. And so we are a world filled with law and with litigation and with disputes. In Japan, people are encouraged not to go to law. If you went to uh, try to take cases to court in the Tokugawa period or uh, earlier, then um, you would probably be punished for taking this to a, a court. Um, in England, people were tried historically by juries, that is by their equals, by 12 people who are their equals. There have never been the juries uh, traditionally in Japan. They were introduced in um, the early 20th century and they failed. They gave them up. They're now trying to introduce them again but in a very Japanese way, it seems to me, the jury system that they're trying to introduce in Japan has no relation whatsoever to what we consider to be a jury. Your jury system, as I understand it, is that you're trying to introduce is basically having a number of ordinary, non-legal professionals who sit with a judge and decide with them. That completely gets the jury system upside down, completely misunderstands what a jury system is. The point of our jury system is to create a body between the power of the state of the crown and the ordinary citizen to act as a buffer. So what we do is we have the jury sitting there, away from the judge, and the judge listens, and he doesn't decide anything, he listens. The the people put their cases to the jury. They decide whether the person is guilty or not. And once they've decided on guilt or innocence, then the judge will give the sentence. In your system, they're all sitting along here, and they're all judges. So it's not a jury system at all. So you still don't, I don't think. And a lot of money is being spent. I hope I'm not offending any of you, but various American universities are uh, getting lots of money I expect from the Japanese government to introduce a jury system to you. But you should have a look at it and see what exactly it is. Anyway, not only do you not have jury systems, um, you don't really have law at all. Um, John Haley and other experts have said that on the whole, law as a system is very little developed. I know that you have a famous faculty of law at Tokyo uh, University and maybe at Cairo. Um, but you have very few lawyers, and you uh, basically try and avoid legal solutions to problems. And indeed, and this was a big shock on my last visit, you have even the basic feature of modern legal systems, which is contract, which is the decision to um, enter relations on the basis of the balanced, equal uh, acceptance of a contractual relationship. When I was uh, writing my book on Japan, and I talked to my friends in Hokkaido, who were both trained at Tokyo Law School. They said, I said, you know, how, how, how important is contract in Japan? And they looked at me and said, contract? We don't have contract in Japan. They knew what it was from their legal training, but they explained that contract, for instance, and I've just been talking about this in 
Look, I don't know. When my friend, the lawyer, uh, ex-lawyer now, international relations in Dean, Hokkaido, um, when he gets a contract, for example, for uh, a book or his house or whatever it is, he doesn't read it. He just signs it and throws it in a, in a waste bin or uh, in a box and never looks at it again. The contract is relatively unimportant. Most relations are based on personal uh, times. Moving on to the family. Um, when I uh, started on the path down the family, which is a subject that interests me a lot, I was amazed to find how similar the structure of the Japanese family and the English family is. Um, I don't know whether um, Princess Takamado will remember the days when I lectured her on kinship systems um, back in the 1970s, but um, Basically, the Japanese, uh, the English family system, as I tried to explain to her, as she sat there in the front row, was, was based on tracing our family through both sides, through descent. And I have another of my ex kinship lecture students at the end of that. I remember, I don't know if Charlotte remembers hearing about cognitive systems and such like. Um, the system is based on tracing descent through both sides. We, so our descent system is pragmatic, as we call it. Our way of referring to our relatives is takes ourselves as the center and then calls people by kinship terms, which create circles of kin around us, like mother, father, uncle, aunt, nephews, nieces, like this, circles. It's based on a system which was developed by some Eskimo, as they used to be called, Inuit people, the Copper Eskimo, so it's a Copper Eskimo kinship terminology. And um, the third feature, which is how you trace, how you pass property down in the family in England, is based on, historically, on single heir inheritance. You pass it to one child preferably male, male firstborn inheritance, what we call male primogeniture. Now, the best analysts of Japanese kinship, like Nakani Chi and other um, historians and anthropologists who work in Japan, describe a system which is identical. Robert Smith, for example, who has written about Japan, shows that the Japanese kinship system has been cognatic, copper Eskimo kinship terminology, and single heir inheritance back for a thousand years. Identical, strange, because the, particularly the system of inheritance by single heirs, before I came to Japan, I thought there was nowhere else in the world that had such a system. All the European countries have a system of family inheritance whereby one the inheritance is shared between the children, and they are, from birth, members of a group which has a right in the, fa in the family property. They cannot be disinherited. They, no one owns the property. It is like an ES system, um, whereby the property is a trust which passes down to all the children. Now, the fact that the English could throw out their children, they could make a will or they could disinherit their children, is the central feature of the book that was mentioned on English individualism. We have always set our children free and, and um, they can succeed or not. But as the famous saying in the book, the great law book of the 13th century was, Nemo est herit viventis. No one is the heir of a living person. As long as your parents are alive, you can't be sure of anything. You are on your own. That is a very strange system, but it's exactly the system that you have in Japan. The difference is that we do it by writing wills and um, 
setting off our property or leaving it to um, a good cause, international, bird life, international, or something like that. Um, but in Japan, you do it by adoption. Fukuzawa, as you know, extraordinary to us, Fukuzawa was adopted into one of his first relatives' families because they didn't have a proper heir. And then later on, his own family needed him. And so he was disadopted and adopted back into his own family. Now, to do that, surely shouting back and forth through adoption would be considered very, very strange. And indeed, it would be considered impossible. You may not know, but adoption as a legal uh, device, a way of proceeding, was impossible in English law until very recently, 150 years or so ago at the most. So throughout English history, there was no adoption. You could leave all your property to someone very easily. Um, and you could foster or look after someone's children, but you couldn't legally adopt them until the Victorian period. So the mechanism is different, but the effect is the same, that the Japanese family is um, artificial and based largely on the, the decision of who is the best person to look after this estate. But it's here that the paths begin to diverge, because in Japan there are strong kinship groups, or fictional, half-true, half not true kinship groups. There are things called the ie. Now, I was giving a lecture yesterday in the uh, Tokyo Women, Christian Women's University, and I asked how many of the audience have ever heard of the ie, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. None of them had heard of it. So I will ask you as well, how many of you have heard of or know of the ie? Sure, Professor Hayami knows about the ear, but he hasn't put his hand up. But um, and I'm sure the princess knows about the ear too. So you're being modest, some of you, but um, it, it, it isn't well known, it seems, among the younger generation. But it is a, a, a very important feature of Japanese traditional history. It's a, a, a kind of like a firm, it's like Mitsui or Mitsubishi, but just much smaller and based on supposedly on family relations and blood, but it is a set of roles which uh, can be, the, pe the people who perform the roles are unreplaceable. So you hire in a wife, and this was how it was explained to us by my friend the other day, you just, you have a wife role, and you hire in a wife. She actually gave me a very extraordinary example, but apparently the new prime minister um, I may have got this slightly wrong, but she said the new Prime Minister has described his second person who he's working with as his um, new wife. Now, if he's used that phrase, he's using it in the sense of a yeah, in other words, a joint partner who does certain useful roles. Not all the roles for wife, presumably, but some of them. So, you hire in a person to do that, you hire in a person to do that, but you make it look like a family. And this is a, an important idea to carry forward if you're coming to my lecture tomorrow on how universities work, because one of the best ways of thinking about them is like the EN. So there is a beginning to be a, a considerable difference. Um, but there's a deeper difference, which is that the whole of family life, the whole feeling of an English or a Japanese family, turns out to be very different. And it starts as soon as you are born in Japan. Um, again, just a, a personal example of it. Our close friends with whom I worked and wrote a book on Japan, the Nakamura's, they had their first daughter in England when they were visiting the scholars there. And they brought her up in the English way. That is to say, they put her in a, a separate room when she was a tiny baby, in a cot. And if she cried in the night, 
they wouldn't feed her until it was time to be fed. Their second and third daughters, when they came back to Japan, they brought up in the Japanese way. The mother was sleeping on a futon, the baby was cuddled up next to her, you fed her on demand. And the characters you'll be pleased to hear of the three little girls has turned out. One is British, uh, she's very independent, strong willed, um, resilient, and British. The other two are very Japanese, you know, um, artistic, sensitive, um, but very clean, much more clinging to their mother. So the whole Japanese way of child rearing and um, the famous amai, or mother complex of Japan, uh, gives the Japanese family and the English family a different feeling. And it's based on a conceptual difference. We look on children in a Christian Western country as basically very rational, independent, um, but basically sinful. Christianity teaches us that people are born sinful, evil. So our task is to shape our children, build up their rational independence, and help them to overcome the temptations of the body and the flesh and all the things that will lead them into sin. In Japan, it, it seemed to me that when I talked to child rearing experts in Japan, you believe the child is very innocent, but also very wild. Your child, as it was often put to me, is like a, a wild little tree. And what you do with your little trees is you tie them all up, and you bind them together, and you turn them into bonsai and such like. They're bound up and constrained and domesticated and civilized. And that's the opposite. Our, our whole effort is to push our children away from us, make them independent, set them on their own two feet, and they never come back. They become independent adults. Your system, and uh, I can never pronounce it right, but the system of the uh, new phenomenon, fairly new phenomenon, the heap of Gomori, is that how you pronounce it? The children who won't leave their rooms in their homes and so on, is an extreme expression of this clinging on. The next um, topic I'd like to look at is the economy. Um, here at first, uh, again, the paths are very, very similar. England had a developed market economy, um, something like uh, 800 years ago, as was mentioned, from the 12th, 13th century. The idea that capitalism, as we know it, was an invention of the 16th, 17th century, the great watershed theory of Karl Marx and so on, is nonsense. If you look at local records and accounts and uh, many other records, you can see that there is what um, the great Marxist historian actually uh, E.P. Thompson calls the long arch of capitalism. It starts very early and develops, obviously, but it is there present. That is the development of the presence of money, contracts, wages, markets, freedom of um, movement, and, and so on. This is a very strange to find it so early. If you had gone to most civilizations, um, even two, three hundred years ago, China, India, and so on, you would find that they were not market economies, they were peasant societies. A peasant society is often defined as sort of small pools of non-market rationality. People who basically transact on the basis of their family relations. Outside that, money is kept and contract is kept from the, on the outside. Now, this strange the old system of market capitalism um, is very similar to what you find in Japan. It appears that from, it seems to me, from the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries at least, Japan had a very developed money system, 
markets, transactions, movement of goods, trading, and money values had spread over much of Japan many centuries ago. And the values that are associated with it, that is the idea that you should acquire the acquisitive spirit, the concentration on making the best use of time and of money, the conscious ethic, which we call the capitalist ethic, is not something which was invented as sort of half implied by a bad reading of Max Weber in the 17th and 18th centuries, but is much deeper and longer. And this is why you find in Japan um, Ehara Sakaku's uh, wonderful book, which is translated as the Japanese storehouse 17th century account of merchant life, is very similar in the way it looks at the world to the great example that um, Weber takes, which is Benjamin Franklin in the 18th century. Very similar mentality. So at first, the economies look similar. But then you get a huge divergence. Rice agriculture is totally different from wheat animal husbandry. England moved for a very long time. It had its first industrial revolution in, as someone once put it, Caris Wilson, in the 12th, 13th century. By that I mean it replaced human labor by machines. At that time it was water and windmills and animals. The second industrial revolution was the coal steam revolution of the 18th century. But it had been moving towards industrialism, the replacement of human labor, for 500 years before that. And there was even quite a lot of use of coal. So we moved to an industrial revolution. Japan moved, and it's a great pleasure to be able to um, use this phrase in the presence of the person who invented it, um, Professor Hayami. <coughs> um, Japan moved towards an industrious revolution, which I owe to Professor Hayami, which is a very nice phrase because it, it captures immediately the difference. An industrious revolution is based on industriousness, that is, hard work, rather than on the replacement. It means more than that, and Professor Hayami has elaborated it, but that is, that is part of its essence. And another great difference is that in England, we separated off the the family and family values and the idea of um, treating other people as individuals in their own right. Um, this, in, in many societies, um, you mix together that, those sentiments with the way you run your economy. So you don't separate the unit of production, how you produce wealth, and the unit of consumption, how you consume, consume wealth. Capitalism is based, as Max Weber pointed out, on the distinction between those two things, um, making them separate. And in England, we did that. We, consumption is one thing, production is another thing. In Japan, that separation um, occurs, but in, a, in an entirely odd way. The family firm predominates in Japan still, of course, not the big, great big industrial conglomerates, and half of your economy, this was explained to me by a Japanese economist in my last visit who was an advisor to Koizumi, and as we sat in the hotel in Tokyo, I looked around and I saw all these people standing around, the staff of the hotel, and I said to this distinguished professor, why are these, why do you employ so many people in your shops and hotels and and so on, who were doing nothing. I saw an example as we were driving to the airport in um, uh, Sapporo, uh, where you had a, a little figure of a um, person waving a flag. There were roadworks, and they'd made a little figure to wave a flag so that um, all the cars could feel happy about proceeding. Now, there was no danger. There was nothing else they could do except drive along. You made a little figure to wave a flag like that, and a bit further along, 
there was a real human being who was standing there, waving a flag, going like this. Now, there were traffic cones here. We could only go down there. What's the point of this person standing there waving his flag? None at all. But my friend said, well, the whole point of the Japanese economy is to distribute money to people and keep them in work. Um, so you treat people as much as you can um, in your consumption system in a non-capitalist way. Your production system is the most efficient, brilliant in the world. Your consumption system is hopelessly pre-capitalist. Um, and this was worrying as economists because in, the, in competition with America, uh, where they treat people, workers ruthlessly, uh, Japan is at a disadvantage. I personally think you're doing exactly the right thing. And people shouldn't be treat, treated as means to them, but you have to be aware of what you're doing. So Japan is half capitalist. It's capitalist in its unsentimental and rational and efficient attitude towards things, the making of things. But it's non capitalist in its treatment of people. Now, time is passing, and um, I really want to have enough time just to deal with religion. So I'll skip over uh, society. Ba the basic point there was that your social structure uh, and our social structure is, at first sight, similar. Once you get down deeper, it's very dissimilar. The, perhaps the, the one point I'll draw out of that is that yours two things. One is you don't have a role or position for religious people. In India and in Europe we have a four-fold class system or state system or caste system. One of them is clergy people, Mandarin and not Mandarins, uh, Brahmins or the clergy. There's no such thing in Japan. This will lead into religion. The other uh, difference is that the pivot of our social system, the most important group in our society for the last thousand years, have been the middle and upper middle class, the gentlemen, the, the middling sort, the uh, middle farmers, the middle industrialists, and so on. So, it's a, the sort of people we like to think who go to Oxford and Cambridge universities and such like. In Japan, as my friend explained to me, the pivot of your social system is lower down. It's in the, what we would call in England, the blue collar workers. The workers in the factories, the people who have very small shops and firms and so on. Uh, and the rich peasants. These are the most important people in Japan historically and they have been the heart of your society. It's even represented in your idea of the body, because for us, this is the most important part of our body, our heads. We had a very interesting discussion in Sapporo, because they asked me where the mind was in, uh, in English thought. I said, well, the mind's obviously up here. This is where we have our brains. Where is the mind for you? So I'll ask you, where is your mind? Where, if you had to point to where your mind was, be very interesting. Be brave, point to some part of your body. Okay? Okay, any others? Yes, thank you. We have some, a few intellectuals over here <laughs> who uh, put it in their head. But most of the audience, and certainly traditionally, your mind was here, along with your heart. What's um, the mind? What is the mind? Well, that's Definition. the question, right? <laughs> <laughs> I won't answer it now. But anyway, um, so you place things further down, and then you have the hara sort of sense of being down here. So we put our social structure up here, you put yours down here, and your mind, and so on. Now, religion, I will end here. Again, the path seemed to start off in exactly the same way. When I read Robert Bella's 
well-known book, Tokugawa Religion. He broadly argues that Japanese Tokugawa religion was very similar to Western Protestant religion, a sort of pure Puritan Protestant way, um, a form of simple, sincere, um, undemonstrative uh, um, religion, ascetic, careful about not wasting things, uh, time and money saving, anxious about being saved, um, self-disciplined, something that we associate in the West with Nichiren or Zen, uh, New Land religions. And certainly when I go, my wife and I go into a Buddhist or a Shinto shrine, the feeling of emptiness, of the absence of lots of statues, there may be some, um, gives me the same feeling that I have when I go into my own college chapel at King's College. It seems quiet, restrained, slightly Puritan, Protestant, or if you go into a Quaker meeting house. So at first it all seems familiar and the same. Yet, as you go deeper, the paths begin to diverge, and this is the most important divergence, I think, of all. Um, and it was brought up again yesterday when I went to this Christian, women's Christian university. I thought, well, women's Christian university, they will all be Christians. They will come up to me afterwards and say, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And things like that, and it would be very um, embarrassing because I'll have to admit that I'm not Okay, now Christian. I asked the audience of about 100 people, how many of you are Christians? One person. <laughs> how many of you know anything about Christians? Christianity? Nothing. None of them. None of them are interested. They've just gone for the education, which uh, was strange to me. But basically, the, what I learned from my Japanese friends, which was shocking to me at the beginning, is that the English are obsessed by religion, all Westerners. And indeed, if you know about the, one of the great Japanese uh, embassies uh, with uh, Prince Ito and others who went to um, America when they were setting up um, the Meiji government. And on the way across, and I always like this story, the there are accounts of what they discussed, and as they were on their boat going towards America in 1860, whatever it was, they sat around and they said, we're in a terrible problem. We know these Americans. They're irrational, crazy people who believe in this thing called religion. They all go around saying they're Christians. This is absolute madness. And yet they seem to take it very, very seriously. If we arrive without a religion, they're going to think we're just backwards barbarians. We don't have this thing called religion. What are we going to do? We know it's stupid, but we've got to play their game. So they sat around and they invented a religion. They thought, well, what do we have in Japan? And the nearest they could come up with was Shinto. So they decided that if anyone asked them what their religion was, they'd say Shinto. Of course, this landed them with a problem because when they got back to Japan, they, they had to admit that they had claimed that Japan was a Shinto nation. So they then had to invent what Shinto was. And so they elaborated state Shinto with the emperor as the head of it and reformed it all. But it was all an invention and they didn't believe in it at the beginning, but gradually as time passed, people began to take it a bit more seriously. I mean, when I first came to Japan, I thought this is the most religious place I've ever been to. There were little shrines everywhere. There were Butsudan in the, in the houses. People talked about kami, they clapped their hands. Um, there were Mikoshi uh, processions. There were, the whole place was more religious on the surface and almost even more so than Cambridge, which has a, quite a lot of people processing around and bells ringing sign to religion, but certainly more than London. And so I thought, what a religious place. 
Then I went into a school of 11, 12 year olds in Sapporo and I said, um, we discussed various things about their careers and their future and then I said to the teacher, could you ask them what religion they are? And I thought some of them might be Buddhist, some might be this and that. And there was a sort of anxious discussion and she tried to say something to them and there was blank faces and after a little while she said, I'm sorry, Professor McFarland, the doctor McFarland perhaps at that time, I, they don't know what you mean. What is this religion? I don't know what you mean. I can't translate it and they certainly will have no idea what you mean. But we don't have this thing in Japan. I said, well, surely you must have it. Watch all these shrines and processions and things. And I said, well, that's not religion. That's just a, a way of behaving. Um, so I said, well, ask them how many of them have heard of the Buddha or have heard of Shinto or have heard of Jesus Christ or Confucius. None of them. None of them have ever heard of any of that. And so my friends and advisors and those I've talked to are absolutely adamant that Japan has no religion still nowadays, except for 0.5% of you who are Christians. The rest of you, you don't have the set by religion. We define religion as a system, um, preferably with one God, monotheistic, but it doesn't matter too much about that. But a system of belief in God as a powerful force and creator of our world and giving sense to our world. So a set of beliefs or dogmas or doctrines, a um, system of morality, that is God is caring about what we do and if we do something good or bad we will go to heaven or hell or be punished. God is watching us all the time. system of morality, not just social ethics, but morality, a God human relation. And thirdly, a set of rituals about how we communicate with God in, in religious settings. And you have to have all three together, and that is a religion. And my friends tell me there is no such thing in Japan. We have social ethics, of course. Again, another little shock was when I went to up to a Shinto priest who was uh, also a university academic in Sapporo, and I said, um, I gather you're a Shinto priest, can I do an interview? And we interviewed him, and he said, I do these rituals. And then I said, let's turn, turn to ethics now. What does it, Shinto tell you about ethical systems? He said, ethics, morality. No, we don't have any of that in Shinto. I, if I want ethics, and whatever I read, Hegel and Kant, Western philosophers. So basically, uh, you didn't, you don't have this. Um, so there's no word for it. The word in Japanese, I think, means a cult. A small group of perhaps crazy people who are led by someone. Um, certainly for us, cult means something like that. And for you, it just means a, a sub-group of believing in something. Now, why don't you have a religion? Because really, you are the only big civilization in the world that doesn't have a religion. And um, in my book, and I can't go into it in detail, I try to explain this and it only finally dawned on me after 15 years of trying to understand Japan what had happened. What happened was that 2,000 years ago, two and a half thousand years ago, all the civilizations of Central uh, of Europe and Asia went through a great shift, a shift on their axis called the Axial Age by a great German philosopher, Karl Jaspers. And simultaneously, all over from Confucius and Lao Tse in China to the Upanishads and the Buddha in India to Zoroaster uh, in Persia to the Old Testament prophets in the Middle East, Elijah and Isaiah, to the Greek philosophers, Plato, Socrates, and so on. Simultaneously, over a period of about 400 years, all of them turn from tribal religions, which basically mean that this world is filled with magic, that there is no other world. The 
when you die, you go into something exactly like this world, if you go anywhere. That every object is both itself and spirit inside it. A world of enchantment, a world of Miyazaki, a world like the one I'd seen when I, Sarah and I work in the Himalayas in a shamanic society where every rock, every tree is enchanted and magical. That is the world of tribal societies. And the history of the world has been one of, as Weber pointed out, of progressive disenchantment, of the loss of that integration. Some people put it down to Descartes and the Cartesian separation of mind and heart. Other people say it's other reasons. Jasper's thought it was a very long process which began in those great philosophical shifts and then was reinforced in the scientific revolution. For whatever reason, it occurred all over Europe and Asia, but it has never come to Japan. Japan is the only non-axial civilization in the world. I was very excited when I discovered this, um, but then I discovered that some of the great American experts uh, on um, Japan, like Robert Bella himself, um, and others are beginning to realize that this is the secret of the specialness of Japan. It has never lost enchantment um, in the way that we have. And this means that you live in a world of symbols, of signs, the empire of signs, as Bach calls it, where everything stands for something else, where 